Hello, my name is Mark Taylor. Welcome to the Education on Fire podcast network. This show is sponsored by the National Association for Primary Education. Hello and welcome to the Education on Fire podcast. The place where we share creative and inspiring learning in our schools. Season 5. Episode 75. Hello and welcome back to the Education on Fire podcast with me, Mark Taylor. Today I'm joined by Alex Dunn, who is from Skills for Sports and somebody I know from probably about 10 or 12 years ago when he was um, teaching me tennis. I started to try try out tennis for the first time and, and he was my first coach and um, since then I know he's been working in schools with my, which my kids have been into and he's also involved in the, the tennis club that I'm associated with. So Alex, thanks very much for being on the podcast. It's great to be here. Thank you. So can we start with a bit of background, really, a bit of history about how you got into sport and, and, and how you sort of made a career out of it? Well, going back to sport really starts back from primary school days and just having good friends around that played lots of different sports. I think I was about nine or so when I first played badminton. Uh, there was lots of empty tennis courts around, so in summer holidays, just running down and getting on those courts before you either got told to pay extra for the court or the rain stop play. So right from an early age, um, lots of friends and cousins and family would get you involved in the sport. Um, secondary school, there was two, three key teachers um, and they ran after school clubs and that was great because uh, the sports that you did in the after school weren't necessarily the sports that you did in PE. So I think the geography teacher took badminton and that was a, a big sport of mine. Um, and so I was ended up playing five or six nights a week uh, from that geography teacher that put me into a link um, and then joined an adult club while I was still playing for juniors went to university um, played badminton at university uh, broke my leg so then I thought um, my playing career is not, not necessarily be over but hold on I'm not invincible and so I got my coaching qualifications in 97 for badminton I was doing a sports degree so I was already thinking down those routes uh, when I got my coaching qualification uh, left university and um, got a job with BT, but in the after school sessions, I was, I was helping the county do some badminton. So that then takes me to Northampton uh, via BT. And I thought, you know what, there's more to life than driving up and down the M1, having meetings, stopping, driving, stopping, stuck in traffic, missing meetings because of traffic. And thought, what do I really like? What are they really passionate about? So I went back to sport got my coaching qualifications in tennis which is how I came across you Mark when yep. I was doing some adult coaching as well as juniors uh, and I was teaching at Northampton College uh, sport sports psychology uh, first aid training and I thought you know I really want to do more and more um, where people are keen to turn up and sadly some people at college aren't necessarily there for the right reasons as in they want to excel in sport or they want to get the qualifications so I I then went self-employed, set up a business skills of sport as a tennis coach. And then the last, since 2011, I've been coaching uh, badminton as well. So I set up Northampton Night Talks in 2011, and it's now the biggest badminton club in the county. Um, and skills of sport is heavily working with, provides the coaching program for Road Tennis Club, which we're at today. Um, so working from three-year-olds up to anyone that, wants to play and can still play and thinks they can still play. <laughs> so so any age really. Uh, and those sports certainly you can play in your late 70s, 80s. Uh, and to be honest, you could play longer. Um, it would just be uh, you're playing at your level as opposed to the level that you might have played 10, 15 years ago. And I guess on that sort of longevity front, it's that kind of the more you play and the more fit you are and, and the mobility is there, then the better you can play for longer as well. So age doesn't necessarily sort of catch up with you just because you're, you're getting older. It's, it's actually, when I guess, when you start and how you keep going as well. It does. And I think the biggest thing for racket sports is because you don't do it on your own. Going to the gym is fine. Training, going for runs, cycling, etc., is fine. But the greatest thing with racket sports is that you're competing against someone. So there's a huge social side. There's a huge network side. And even if you're going to go and play singles, there's a little bit of banter before the match. There's a bit of banter during the match. And then you quite often have a beer or you'll sit and reflect on the match. And so that, I think, gets you out the house. You look forward to it. 
and meeting, socialising, networking has got to be a huge thing for your for your well being. And so, you know, going right through to the uh, later ages in your life or from two or three year olds going to nursery and, and playing sport and getting a regular what do we do on Saturday afternoon, what do we do on Tuesday after school, etc. You're meeting new people in an environment that you like. So yeah. And I guess from a school and a teacher's point of view, that sort of setting that sort of lifelong love of sports and, and and learning really starts from their sort of first interest in PE in school. So I guess that's where the that's a really key point to get that sort of ig, sort of ignition, as it were, or, or Defin- um, de- passion definitely. into it. Uh, primary schools are are so important. Although a lot of sports will have preschool, it's so hard to find out where they are. And a lot of the people who attend the preschool sports would have an older brother or sister, uh, or word of mouth, a very good friend. So it's usually the second child that's come into the family who is playing the sport, then finds out, oh, actually, you do a younger session, do you? Oh, only if we'd known that. Oh, well, actually, we have in six months' time. Uh, our, our baby will be that age, or next door neighbor's child, can they come? And so if they missed out on that, then primary school is the number one area that they start learning all the basics and will give them that route to go to a school session, an after school session, or even a club link session because they've got some basics and some fundamentals from the school. And and what are those sort of basic and fundamentals? What what are the things in sort of primary school PE which you think can really help them develop in whichever sport they I guess if sport is the aim at the end of the day whereas PE specifically within school has given you the sets of skills that you need to be able to take you in that direction definitely and there's 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 probably a whole 27 podcast of trying to say (laughs) what's the difference in PE and games and is games games and is PE Um, I think if if you look educationally at PE you're going to look at some basic skills and, and a little bit more discipline um, but it doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to be, you know, cha- it can be very challenging. It can be great fun. So balance is, is, is a key one. Um, movement and uh, keeping control of your own of your own body weight. So running and stopping as opposed to running, stopping and taking some extra steps. Being in control of your own body weight on all fours, on two, on three, uh, moving up, moving down. Um, and I certainly remember being in primary school um, growing from a from an acorn into a tree and moving and thinking well what's this got to do with PE but of course you're you're moving you're changing your shape and your balance and your arms are going up so you're taking your weight outside of your base and so the, 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 there is some some definite links with dance into PE into sport and and, and vice versa um, so you've also got strength um, your own body weight as, as well as what you can then throw um, but but probably the the main things that I focus on um, would be sending and receiving. So, so being able to track and follow something uh, away from you, but coming towards you, um, and then actually having the control to be able to do that for someone else. So it might start off with rolling. Um, can they roll the ball to their parents? And how many times when you're at a party or you've got children around you that you get fed up that the child's not actually throwing it back to you? But actually, for PE, that's that's fine. But in sport, you do actually want them to keep throwing that ball away from the person. So although it's a pain for an adult to have to keep running after the ball, no, roll it back to me, no, no, no. You want them to roll it away from you so that when they're playing a match, that becomes natural, whether it's tennis, whether it's badminton, whether it's football playing the ball into space, whether it's cricket hitting a ball into space rather than always finding the fielder or always finding their opponent. So, so right from an early age, and this could be nine months, 18 months, going into primary school, um, you know, let's get some, some key things about, can they control a ball to a target? And then actually, can they think and roll the ball away from it? Okay, so once, you've, once the rolling has taken place, it's then an understanding of, if you have a distance, can you get that ball to bounce once to that target? Can you then change the height the power, the speed, to bounce twice, to bounce three times, or maybe not at all. And it's having that understanding of the depth, the distance, the height, when you're hitting something or throwing something, but then the person who's trying to catch it to actually understand that that ball won't always do the same thing each time. And if these skills are taught quite quickly, reception, 
year one in primary school, then actually you can quite quickly get year two with, with rackets, whether it's tennis rackets, badminton rackets, with a cricket bat, with a hockey ball. You can progress quite quickly with that because they have an understanding of depth. They have an understanding of, of what something is going to come through. And the, the worst scenario is, is to have 30 children and because none of them can pass the ball backwards and forwards to each other, you have them all in one line because you know it's only the teacher or the adult that can actually send that ball correctly to them. So if you've, if you've then got 15 children that can pass to their partner correctly, you can have such huge accelerated learning and, and safe experiences in that I'm going to throw the ball to you and it's not going to go three people down in a line. So the person who's going to hit it is now going to come charging across everyone because they've seen their ball. And now it, it's like dodgeball, but with racket swinging. And straight away, you, you can picture that and think, in the staff room at lunchtime I've got tennis it's now going to be with year one maybe we won't do tennis and that seems to be the horror story the the reason why rackets aren't brought in why we keep it safe and we roll balls and we bounce balls but we never progress because the the basic fundamentals of of, of being able to work as a pair keeping to plan listening being happy to make errors you know and learn from those mistakes means that by secondary school, actually they can really push on with those skills as opposed to, sadly, you find that the bucket of balls that was bought at the beginning of term has now disappeared three weeks in because they don't have the skills still at secondary school to be able to control that ball. And you sort of said about a plan, and that's really important. I sort of think to the more um, academic subjects, there's always a plan, you know, that everything's planned to the nth degree. Um, when it comes to PE, do staff, um, do they have that general understanding, do you think, in your experience or, or through the curriculum? Is there a, a set of things they need to be going through in order to get that going? And, and why do you think there's a breakdown sometimes of, of their not being able to get from that sort of basic skills to a racket to um, whatever the next stage would be um, because that's not being followed all the way through? I think th- the number one reason, c- and, and, and going from a teacher at, at, at a college um, to working as a coach in a primary school is that if you teach children maths, spelling, you know, adding, etc., then it will always be right on the Monday, it'll be right on the Tuesday, it'll be right on the Wednesday. So once your class has it, they can quite quickly move forwards with that and they know what the next progression is, is the times tables, etc. And, and, and greater spelling and then into grammar and writing stories. And, and the progression for PE isn't PE outside it is sport so they're learning those skills to eventually play sport all the time on TV all the heroes the legends are spoken about mum and dad's superheroes on TV etc everything is connected with sport it's not this is the greatest PE person so children don't really understand what is PE they just think it is sport so if a racket comes out as far as they're concerned I've played it on the computer game last night. I'm really good at this. And within two minutes, I'm going to be able to play tennis. But there's a huge gulf between rolling that ball and bouncing that ball. And we don't have the focus, the skills, um, to be able to take that person from one plus one to nine times table. We don't have that progression in PE to go, let's roll a ball. And why we're rolling a ball and now bouncing a ball is that by the time when you're in year five and year six, this could be a return of serve. This could be uh, a shot down the line and then advance the net. This could be a drop shot in badminton lunging forwards. Uh, this could be the start of your uh, spin bowling technique or, or a volleyball serve. Because the, a lot of the teachers w- don't necessarily play the sport themselves, so can't link what they're doing. That's not necessarily the teacher's fault because maybe they're more of a math specialist than English specialist. But unless that progression goes through, then quite often the the lessons, although maybe linked in that year, are in isolation from what a child will then develop and how they will relate that skill to a sport that they've done. So I guess this brings us on to the next obvious question, which would be, 
is it better therefore to have specialist teachers coming in doing PE that sort of understand that progression in in, in that way because as we said the hard thing for teachers these days is that especially um, relatively newly qualified teachers is the amount of training you get in things like sports and music and the arts and that kind of thing is relatively short compared to what you have to learn overall and get in get all the information you need to get across when you're a teacher um so are having specialist people in a good idea from that point of view or actually is there probably a better combination where they can learn from some specialists which then upskill them effectively on the on the job i i I would say if a school is big enough and can have a specialist in pe then fantastic brilliant because that's that's their main focus however i think we also need to try and tap into those teachers that do sport outside of school so rather than saying to someone that might be more into music to say well actually we would like you now to be doing more pe that's not really their their cup of tea that's not i'm not saying they won't do it whereas if someone let's say played netball to quite a good level or played sport, or their children play sport and they're very active in, in tennis, netball, hockey, then it would be much easier for them because they're in amongst it. And it's 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 this... You probably get it occasionally in maths and in, in, in English where you have a child who is far more advanced than what the class they're in. However, if you then run a tennis session and you're talking about years two and three, uh, I have children here at the tennis club who come along with their parents and the two-year-olds. So by the time they're in year three, year two, they, they may be on the verge of playing for the county. They will certainly know how to score. They will be able to do overhead serves. They'll be playing points, maybe not winning the matches, but they know how to compete and know what they're trying to do. The knowledge of that child could be far more than what the teacher has, and therefore that's quite intimidating when you're going into a class and you're trying to do your best, and there's a child in the class who's then saying, well, you don't score like that. It's this way or that way. Whereas it's probably unlikely that that child will have the same knowledge in maths or a greater knowledge in maths. And and sometimes it does happen. You're you're seeing the news, children uh, in year six possibly taking GCSEs, um, accelerated maths uh, courses. Um, But I think it happens far more in, in sport because of the outside clubs, the parents that might work with the children if they play the sports, the brothers and sisters. And it's not very often in our culture that that family environment will say, okay, we're all going to be doing maths for as soon as we come home from school. Whereas they will be play sport or they will do music or they will do um, uh, art and paintings, etc. And so there's a huge fear factor of... Um, a primary school teacher that's not PE specialised going into things like tennis or cricket etc where they may fear that some of the children have a higher knowledge than them and that could be quite intimidating or you could have the skills and confidence to say we'll bring them on board and do that but that's only through confidence and having the knowledge yeah um, rather than thinking oh this is I'm, I'm, I'm already struggling so going back to the point um, specialists coming in uh, I th- certainly think in the North Ants area there are a lot of people who work with schools uh, level 3 coaches, level 2 coaches going in and getting some great rapport a lot of those then have um, like a school club link so whether it's breakfast club lunchtime club, after school club whether it's even curriculum time um, they will quite often say well you're really good you're interested how about coming along to a free taster session? How long coming into a tournament? There's a family day. And so they've got that really close school club link. That then helps for the teachers because they then can be in the lesson when the coach is giving out some real key teaching points um, and may then challenge the, t- the coach after. Um, however, if it's a PPA lesson, um, usually then the teacher's not there. So it might be a teaching assistant or it might not be, might not be anyone there. And therefore, those teaching points, those really key bits of information are going to the child, which makes the child more knowledgeable and, again, has a vicious circle. So, again, they're learning more than the teacher. So when the teacher comes, they're doing their best job. Oh, but Alex, the coach said, uh, you get a second serve, not a first serve. Or you can hit it like this. It doesn't have to always be like this. And so there's a little bit of confrontation 
some of the schools I work in, the teachers are, uh, are making notes down. And at the end of it, we usually have a quick five minutes. Uh, why did you cover this bit? And why about that? And what happens if we don't have that equipment? Could we use this? Oh, that's an interesting idea. We've never thought of using it that way. And that's great because it keeps you on your toes. Um, but it then means that once you've left that school, you think you've left that sport in a better place. And if I go back in a year's time, um, badminton, tennis, whatever sport it is that's taken place, has grown a little bit more because the teachers are passionate and therefore their children will be passionate. And and you said about the fear, and I think that's that's true so much when you're out of your comfort zone. So not only is it not necessarily your specialist, but you're not even in your own environment. You know, you're not in your classroom. You haven't got your safety net around you. You're in the hall or maybe yeah. you're outside or, yeah. or maybe you don't even know whether you should be indoor or outdoor, yeah. depending yeah. on what you're doing. So there's a lot to consider, isn't there? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, coaching badminton... Um, it's a no-brainer, always indoors. I mean, it's sunny today, but it's quite windy. But if it's tennis, you have different size balls, different size rackets. And, you know, if you picture the basic primary school hall, you're going to have a piano, maybe some, some other musical instruments, some cymbals, some drums, possibly. You'll have some paper mashing masks. You'll have the awards board. You might have a little display. You might have um, some things that are, are, have been left and if balls are whizzing around everywhere, it doesn't take long for those things to be damaged, um, balls lost, and even just bound, balls bouncing back off. And if you've got outdoor balls, then it's going to hurt a lot more than foam balls. But then a school has a budget. And if that budget, people, again, aren't necessarily aware of, oh, should we get 12 indoor balls and 20 outdoor balls? Oh, well, let's just get more outdoor balls. And, of course, they then come in because it's raining or it's windy or there's something going on in the in the uh, sports uh, area, the field, uh, the Mooga, then um, those balls aren't appropriate for indoors. And then you get injuries, and as soon as you start getting injuries, you're thinking, this is maybe another reason why we don't play this sport or we don't teach this mm. sport. And, and all these things just chip and knock away. And therefore, if you haven't got people who are passionate to play, those sports that are maybe easier to play or those activities are easier to do, safer to do, then come to the forefront. And and I think painting, it's a little bit what you said before, but that painting that picture about why you're doing all of these things. I still, I mean, it wasn't primary school, it was secondary school, but we had a, a PE teacher, and I can still remember him now talking about using your back, how you lift things, all of that. So, I mean, it was just every lesson, but with good reason, and, and it's... Um, you know, it's put me in good stead as I've gone through into later years and and that kind of thing. But actually, being able to paint the picture from that early age about we're learning these skills because of this and we're doing this like this and we don't do this because you might hurt somebody or injure someone, you know, or whatever it happens to be. All of those things are really important as you progress then into sports and, and move beyond that. Yeah, uh, the, I do it. Uh, the LTA have um, primary school and secondary school teacher training courses and really great numbers. Uh, all the teachers then start coming out after 10, 15 minutes out of the shell with that little competitive edge as soon as they start seeing some of the challenges. And you, you, you look around when we're doing underarm throwing and we might be doing it to some targets, we might be doing it to some rackets. And when you say this underarm action is actually your forehand in a game of tennis. So you're practicing your forehand even though you're doing underarm throw but follow through that throw. Don't just stop at the point of exit as the ball's leaving your hand. Then they're like, oh, okay, we can see where this is going from. So rather than in your first lesson doing forehands, rack it straight out and all the balls get lost within <laughs> two or three minutes. Now actually we've got some control. Now I've actually can see the progressions. We can move the racket nearer as a target. We can change the target. We could try and get them to um, get it to bounce without a bounce so it's hitting it. And all the time that forehand's being practiced safely. It's only once you've got that knowledge that you can then go, okay, how could we progress this one step more? And each time you're doing it, you're getting some great basic skills. And once that racket comes into your hand, oh, this feels natural. And oh, wow, that was a great shot. And, and straight away, there's huge success. 
rather than starting with it and losing all the balls and everyone's get frustrated, you're having to go to the other side of the sports hall, you're having to go to the other side of the field to collect the ball. That then sort of really breaks down the, the sessions. If some children are hitting balls over fences, then the neighbours are not only complaining, but their caretakers complaining. <laughs> and all of a sudden the lesson stops because you've gone from a bucket of balls to one or two. So the, the, there's so many positive things by starting off slowly, but, but you need to understand those progressions. Yeah, uh, The LTA course for the primary school teacher is a three-hour course and, and great dvds great books um but rather than just that it's good to get on a course to then speak to a coach because they'll also give you some other little ideas and some nuggets um so that's a great course to get onto and and this is the time to do it isn't it because there is funding around for pe now and 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 actually it being used for training, um, getting some understanding from that training to know, like I said, what resources to buy and what equipment to have. Now's the time to make the most of it. And if you feel your score can actually be enhanced by this, I mean, just take it as soon as you can. Definitely. Uh, multi-skills was a very big um, ethos idea, um, step into primary schools. And from that, a lot of the drawings, the diagrams, all the uh, agility, balance, coordination, warm-ups that the LTA have, you recognise quite a few of the characters and some of the drills. And and after the first break on the course, a lot of the teachers will say, well, we could use this for hockey, or we could use this for badminton, or we could use this for net basketball. Definitely. Just because you've got tennis balls out doesn't have to be for that sport. And I think that's another thing, that once you've got more confidence, you can go, I know we're teaching tennis, but let's get those basketballs out and let's practice some throwing over the net. It's a bigger ball to catch. We might get more success. Is it easy to teach a game with bigger balls and where you can see the child develop their tactical knowledge when they can throw and catch? Um, and, and so don't be afraid to, to not just do cross-curriculum, as in bring a bit of maths into PE, but actually cross the sports and cross the equipment. Uh, Babington indoors works really well for instance with tennis when it's raining because when you're throwing shuttles around they don't go a, a long way so the picture that I painted before about the foam balls and the tennis balls all whizzing around the hall actually it's very hard to throw a shuttlecock to hit a ceiling to go to the other end of the hall it just stops it doesn't bounce it doesn't roll away so straight away even if they can't catch it oh and get some more success they can throw that shuttle really high and get great technique but it'll only go high if they have the technique you can throw out tennis ball in all sorts of ways yeah. and it can hit the targets, it can go high. Um, so definitely start looking and speaking to the school sports partnerships. They run lots of courses, speaking to the governing bodies. Everyone is passionate about getting their sport into schools, uh, getting them at an early age, building those skills up. And there will be some costs on courses, but I'm sure if, if you contact them, you'll find out funding but also use the school budget to help pay and and sometimes i'm sure that coming towards the end of the year uh, there'll be a large chunk of budget unused because oh we did a rugby course we did a such and such a course 18 months ago but it might have changed it might have been updated there might be add-ons you know why can't you do um uh, a foot skills course or, or a racket skills course after 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 work twilight time uh, maybe 3.30 to 4.30 and just come in with a whole new range of fresh ideas and start using the budget that way. And like I said, there's a whole range of organisations that can help you. So, you you know, you've got your immediate community where you might, like here, we've got the Tennis Club in yeah. the village and, yeah. and then you've got county-related yes. organisations. And I know certainly in Northamptonshire, you know, the Saints Rugby... I mean, is is a massive team within the Premiership, and yeah. and they have all sorts of outreach yeah. things. So it literally can be on your doorstep, yeah. but still have varying levels, yeah. and and also their resources, which they're keen to get into schools. Definitely, I think I think um, tennis, badminton, uh, basketball, possibly hockey are a huge disadvantage in Northampton because you do have the Saints, you do have the Cobblers, and the County Cricket. Yeah, and they're three very established sports, but they do a lot of work in schools too. So you've got that program all taking place. In fact, one primary school, as I was leaving, uh, having done a breakfast tennis club, both um, or all three sports came in yeah. and they were doing like a three uh, staged session. And it was great to see. Uh, but then you're thinking, oh, we need, maybe need to have squash, badminton, table tennis, tennis, 
badminton, table tennis, or whatever the three racket sports to go in to yeah. challenge that. Because obviously, sport is amazing. You can play team sport, you can play one on one, you can play against the elements. You know, climbing, uh, sailing, running is is as much about you, but it's also about the conditions and the the environment. So you could go for a run uh, and do a really great time and do the same course, and it could be a lot slower. It could be very much easier if the wind's behind you or it could be absolutely horrendous if the wind, the rain and everything is against you. Um, so there, there is an amazing amount out there um, for North Hans, and I'm sure uh, if you start looking across other counties in the UK, there will be cricket, there will be rugby, there will be football and if one of those drops down, I'm sure there is another sport that's equally as as large in that area so if maybe if you go down to Hampshire maybe sailing would be more prevalent if you're in North Wales then maybe more of the outward bounds and the rock climbing etc would be more prevalent so I would definitely think that um, each county will be unique but there'll be so many opportunities if you then start you know contacting a yeah. few people and, and, I, and I really like the fact that it is using what you've got to available to you isn't it and that involves your skills and like you said the sports yeah. that you've played before yeah. if you're involved as a teacher what you have in your local your local community and your local environment because if, if you live near the coast then of course you have the water and all those sorts of things you can do so to, I mean I think not being afraid to say it has to look like this I'm doing PE in school and it is this and or it's that you've got a bit more freedom than that and actually being able to res- pull the resources that you've got is um is key yeah, absolutely, and 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 that also goes when when you go into a lesson uh, as a coach. And I silly said in one school that I've got a, sp- a sport or a game uh, for every letter of the alphabet. And then of course straight away someone said, "Oh, all right, Z." So I had to think on my toes, and I just and he said, "Oh, zealot." So we played this game, and um, and it was basically their primary school was was um, on a huge slope. So we couldn't play tennis properly because it was such an advantage for one side. Mm-hmm. So we deliberately had a sort of goalkeeping team um, that were was a third of the class. We had, so they couldn't let the ball roll out through the gate or over the gates onto the road. We had a middle team that had to try and stop everything before it got to them. And then we had a batting team that, that had to try and get it over the first team. Uh, and, and through the second team. But once they hit it, then he had to do some separate skills at the side. And it involved so many of the, the tennis skills. So it was about moving, it was about coordination, it was about tracking, it was about teamwork, it was understanding the weaknesses and strengths. And it was like, well, let's just do this then the following week and then the following week. And by the time we came to the end, we managed to, it was, it was dry, we went onto a field. The field was flat, we played some tennis. And although we hadn't practiced tennis as a game, uh, all those skills became quite relevant and actually they were pretty good at the game yeah. because they practiced running the jumping tracking a ball you know uh, knowing not to hit it too hard if it was windy because it would go straight out and if it's straight out they were out and so um, you, you can once you've got some skills create so many more new games and every primary school hall every primary school yard field will have a different shape buildings so you might be able to play this game you might not be able to play that game and so having the, the the confidence as a PE teacher to say, right, we are going to play a game, but it's not quite rounders because we're going to have this wall that's in and that wall that's not. And straight away that then challenges everyone from the left-hand side or the right-hand side or hitting it straight. Um, and it might be, well, if you can throw the ball against that wall rather than throwing it back, then it's out. Or you know. And so each, each school could have their own unique game. And if you go back to... Um, private school where how rugby started and all, and all these uh, mob rule sports then actually the Eaton war game is is how they played their game at their private school and I'm sure there are other very quirky games that have been passed down in history so primary schools in a way would only be doing what private schools did in the 1900s <laughs> and 1800s yeah uh, but their games have carried on yeah and and now we want to play fives or now we want to play the Eaton war game or we want to go to ashburn and, and and try this mob rule football or getting the pigs batter for the other side but but they're all teaching you something and and they're obviously good fun because they've carried on 
And also, I think being able to do it so that you're learning with the children is always a brilliant thing. Because, like I say, if, if you think your PE lesson needs to be some kind of now we're going to be learning tennis, then like you say, if you can play tennis, then great. If you're out of your comfort zone, then that's going to be really tricky. But starting sort of further down the school, if it's we're going to start by doing the rolling, we're going to do the bouncing, things which you can understand and you can put together as you then develop that through. So it's great to have... I guess resources there are lots of things online where they can provide lesson plans and all that kind of thing but just hopefully having the ability to be able to use it in the way that works for you in your school so to be able to adapt it like I say we're going to create our own game because this is our environment but I've got an idea of where this is going and how I'm going to use it and just build that up bit by bit so don't try and start a tennis club on day one start by those things and then learn with the children as you go through and develop all of those things yeah and it's very it's it's very obvious when children have had those skills because they're happy to carry on and repeat those skills so if we were just going to throw a ball backwards and forwards over a net at a tennis club if you've done that before and you and you and you've practiced that and you're quite good at that then you're happy to do that as a warm-up if you've not done that before you're going to turn up to a tennis club and go well where's my racket you pick your racket up someone hits you a ball you miss it you run after it you start at the baseline you whack a ball it goes out of the fence so actually, although it might seem boring, repetitive, those fundamental uh, little activities and games are, are so important and therefore play around with some scoring. So it might be you both start on five, if one person wins a point, they go up to six, you go down to four. It might be that you've got to get a rally together. It might be that you've got to do it as a class. So within three minutes, can we do this many as a class? So constantly... You're, you're, you're changing the activity by the score to keep that little bit of competition, uh, but to keep the motivation and the excitement there. And if, if someone's doing really well, then just alter their little activity. So it might be rolling two metres. If someone's doing it really well, go to four metres. If someone's doing it really well, throw it between two cones. If someone's doing it really well, make them run along in a diagonal to roll it. If someone's doing really well, get them to pick up and they've got to roll four balls in the space. So you can, once you've got it, you can just add a little bit and add a little bit. And the greatest thing for a teacher is, as long as you can demonstrate the first little one, first little activity, first challenge, you don't have to be able to demonstrate everything. You're just adding one extra on. So it might well be something, let's say, hopscotch. Can you do hopscotch with your right foot? Can you do hopscotch with left foot? Can you do hopscotch at front? Can you do hopscotch turning round? Can you do hopscotch with eyes closed? Can you now do hopscotch while you're patting your head and stroking your tummy? Can you do hopscotch saying your times tables backwards? You might not be able to do this, but if the children can, you're just adding one extra each time, each time. And then it might be like, this is the class challenge now. You've got to do your four times tables backwards but not mentioning the number 16 or, or a six. You've got to be tapping your head and stroking to something and doing hopscotch. Wow, you know, that, that that's going to challenge anyone. If, but if you started off with that, oh no, this is too hard, possible. And so just those small little steps, you know, you, and, and you could be so creative, you know, but then you own it then and you can write it down and have the class challenge and say, wow, in this lesson we started off with hopscotch, but look where someone went to, right? There's your challenge, everyone. There's your homework. Can anyone come back and do that for next week? Yeah. And the great thing is is that you know the children better than anyone, so you're in the best position to create these things yeah. because you can adapt it to the the sorts of either the topic you're doing in yeah. class or yeah. you know a little bit about the kids enough to be able to um, make it related to something they're yeah. interested in, and that's, that's the best and, way, really. And probably the, the most important point is children's imagination. No matter how well you come up with something, they'll probably have an even better idea. Yeah. So don't be afraid to open it up to the class. And and that happens every day on a tennis court. You know, well, what happens if I do it like this? Okay, we'll try that. Well, that didn't work. Ah, but if I was a spaceman and I leapt and jumped and hit it, okay, well, let's do that. Wow, you can do that. But I never thought of him being a spaceman. I've always thought of him being a tennis player. So now I'm telling him to be a spaceman and now he's light on his feet and he's bounding around the court. And he's hitting these great shots. So always open it up and, you know, within reason, of course. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. So we talked before about actually maybe getting some video of some of this sort of thing. And, and we talked about sort of the community aspect as well. Yeah. And um, and the one thing I do like is the idea of the parents and the children doing it together. Because then 
everyone's sort of teaching each other you're bringing people into the school or you're taking them from the the school into the local clubs and that kind of thing so so what sort of things do you think we might be able to do that would be great to be able to sort of see in terms of the sorts of things we've been talking about as yeah well? definitely well uh, on a saturday morning at the moment i do uh, a mini and me session so these are up to three-year-olds uh, children uh, where the mum or the dad whoever draws the short straw on a saturday morning <laughs> gets up comes down to the club um and it's more about they know their child. They know how much they can focus, not focus. Um, they know what swings them round, whether it's going to the park after, uh, getting a suite after, whatever it is. They know the motivation. So I'm actually teaching the parents on how to play tennis rather than a parent thinking they know or not knowing and the child missing out. So if they then go and practice, they can say, oh, remember what Alex said? And... We'll get rackets out, but a lot of it will be about balancing and, and challenging. And of course, that parent is going to be so passionate for their child to improve, and they're going to have all the patience for their child to improve. And I'm sort of overseeing the whole session. So if we looked at something like that uh, at the tennis club, um, and we're happy to do it maybe on a Sunday afternoon or something like that, um, children and parents to come along. Uh, we could do an hour session of tennis. Um, but not necessarily starting off at tennis, leading up with some skills to playing a game of some description of tennis. And that might be over some cones, it might be over some lines, it might be over a whole thin tape, a long skipping rope, or it might be on a tennis court. At the end of the day, we can set the rules that we want to set, yeah. depending on how far we've got those skills. So it might bounce three times, we might actually catch it. We might do an overarm throw and then pick up our racket and play. We might catch with cones. So I'm happy to set up a session um, where the parents and the children come along and we go through a whole progression and depending on the age groups of the children turning up, depending on already the ability of the children and parents, then we can still look at those progressions going from if there are some four and five year olds turning up, if there are some 10 year olds turning up with their parents, that's fine, that's not an issue, you know. We're not doing a tennis masterclass. We're looking at the skills you would need for tennis and getting a greater understanding. So if you're in a park or in the beach on holiday without the rackets and things, you can still practice some of those skills. And I think what will be really great about that is it's the sort of thing which I know schools are interested in, which is how do we get parents involved more? How do we get the community involved more? And so by being able to show some of these things which are happening sort yeah. of outside of school, yeah. you can do that. Well. Yeah on this afternoon yeah. if you can come along we're going to do this sort of thing you know because you can do it with your child and you can be part of the school and you can like you say your imagination's the the only limiter really you can make it into anything you want to do whether it's your sort of summer fair yeah. or, or yeah. any or any sports sort of day thing. maybe or exactly. something like that yeah. you know yeah an open workshop sports day yeah perfect so i think that'll be really great to be able to see and we'll we'll have that on the website and we'll um have some of those sort of live videos and, and then we'll sort of be able to sort of try and wind all that together so that it really sort of links back into the schools and the sorts of things you can do as teachers. Fantastic. Thanks so much for chatting. It's been really interesting getting your insights from, from all of these things and I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Mark. And uh, just keep playing outside. Thanks for listening to the Education on Fire podcast. For more information of each episode and to get in touch, go to educationonfire.com. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire.